What comes to your mind when you think about virtual reality? Do you think about neon grids and 80s synthwave music? Do you think about porn? Or do you think about flying in a spaceship or fighting dragons? Or whimsical avatars meeting in absurd worlds? Well, these were some of the things that I had in mind when I started my journey into virtual reality in 2012 as a young cognitive scientist doing research on human navigational behavior at the iSpace Lab in Vancouver, Canada. But as a researcher, our virtual worlds were a bit more modest than that. But then, while I was writing my thesis in 2012, the Oculus Rift kicked off a new wave of consumer VR. And slowly, these kind of experiences started coming along. But it was not until 2015 that my conception of VR changed. And it changed while I was looking at a grave. And it was a real grave. But it was in VR. It was scanned by David Finsterwalder a couple of months earlier during an archaeological dig. And while I was there looking at these bones that were over a thousand years old and the stones that were around them, he told me that, by the way, this place is actually not accessible anymore. It's dug in again under a couple of centimeters of concrete. And I realized that apparently VR can not only bring us into fantastical worlds that we come up with, but we can also use it as a portal to the real world, to the real world that we normally cannot get to and that we can't see anymore. Half a year later, David and I started a company called Realities.io with the mission to make real world places explorable that were out of reach before. So, how do you get the real world into VR? We are mainly using a process called photogrammetry, which, as you might guess, forces us to take a lot of pictures of a certain object or a scene. We can take then all these pictures and we can run them through an algorithm, extracting features, creating a point cloud of the surface area. We can then connect these points into a mesh and then take the mesh and project the photo textures back on it. And this way, we end up with a really photorealistic model of the environment. And it will have all the little scratches, all the little dirt, all the things that make a place real in it. Photogrammetry is not a new thing. It's been around since 1800. And it's been used in cartography a lot. And you had to use these funny tables to actually connect all these dots. So of course, you could only do a few of them. But today, with modern computing technology and amazing software like uh, Reality Capture, you can actually do this with billions of points and with thousands and thousands of photos. So we can map huge spaces. Over the last years, we've taken this process of scanning things with photogrammetry and bringing them into VR much more quick and efficient and reliable, turning what was an obscure sequence of tools into our custom pipeline that can run all these things automatically and optimize things for VR. And over the years, we've also gotten pretty good at it. Can you tell which side of this is the screenshot from the virtual engine and which is real? I'll help you. So why should we put things in VR? We have all these awesome gadgets already. Why another one? Well, over the years, we've made some really interesting ways of interacting with computers. We started out with punch cards, then eventually got to more interactivity with the command line interface, and then to uh, graphical user interfaces, and eventually touch screens that we all carry around in our pockets. But while every step along the way, things became more explorable, less abstract, more spatial, and just overall easier to use for everybody, something's never changed. There was always a screen in between us and the digital world. There was always this demarcation line between us, the user in meat space, and all the wonders in cyberspace. And all we could do is like look through this tiny window and move a little piece of plastic on our desks to interact with that. What VR does is it allows us to enter cyberspace. It allows us to enter the digital world 
and to bring our bodies in there, to really be there with what is called presence. So think of it as the comparison between watching fish in a fish tank and diving in the ocean with them. So why does this matter? VR is the first digital medium enabling first-hand embodied experiences. And this is a big deal, because this means that the information that you can convey is very different. If I tell you, oh, this building is very huge, it has 40 meters of ceiling height, well, that's kind of what is called propositional knowledge, textbook knowledge. You can process that on an abstract level, but you don't feel it. You don't, you know, experience it. With VR, we can convey what is called experiential knowledge, knowledge where you have to be there to, to, to feel that. You can feel how tall a building is. You can feel how huge it is. You can feel how old it is. And these are the things that really matter, especially when creating educational experiences. So are we all going to start only traveling in VR? Is it time to book your next beach vacation in virtual reality? I don't think so. While VR is amazing, it is still in its infancy. And there are many things that it's not good at. If you want to go to the beach, you want to feel the sand between your feet, you want to dive into the water, you want to smell the ocean. All these things VR cannot do yet and will not be able to do that for a while. But it is really great for exploring some, some places because some places are just out of reach for most of us. So let's talk about some of these places. So, some places are just not accessible for the general public. One of those places, actually quite close to our TEDx stage in Bonn here, is the Cologne Cathedral, which we partnered up with the WDR, the uh, public German broadcaster, to scan. And there, what we did is we focused not on the parts of the Cologne Cathedral that you can you know, visit anyway as a visitor, but we focus on the parts that are usually off limits for the general public. While you can walk along the benches, you cannot walk up to the altar, nor can you walk into the choir area normally. But in VR you can, and you can take all the time you want to check it out. And you can do so without hundreds of other tourists around you with their cameras and crying, uh, crying babies. There are other places that are just too dangerous to visit. In 2017, our friends from Now Here Media, who are amazing uh, VR storytellers and VR journalists, approached us. They were working on a project about the impacts of IEDs, improvised explosive devices, in war zones all around the world. And their plan was to go to Iraq to tell a story of one of the victims. So we taught them how to do photogrammetry scanning, and they traveled to Iraq where they met Ahmed, who lost two of his sons in an ISIS booby trap when they came home after war into their, into their uh, home. And VR turned this into a very, very special experience because you were invited in Ahmed's home, you would meet him in there, and he would personally tell you the story of how he lost his two sons. And when people came out of this experience, they were crying because it was a very, very personal experience. And so this experience was used and shown, for example, at the UN headquarters in New York to raise funds for demining and help people like Ahmed in the future. There are other places that you and I just can't get to because we don't have the required skills. One of those places is on the bottom of the Baltic Sea where the warship Mars lies. The Mars was a 16th century warship that sunk in its maiden, voyage, uh, in its maiden battle and has been on the floor, undiscovered, for hundreds of years. It was even said there's a curse on it so it can never be found again. But in 2011, the crew of Ocean Discovery and the two brothers, the two Lindgren brothers, found it and they organized several diving expeditions down there. And what they did is they took a lot of photographs and turned this whole thing into a photogrammetry scan. Eventually, they reached out to us, and we partnered up with Facebook and the amazing team from Prefrontal Cortex to turn this into a VR experience. 
in which you step into the shoes of the divers and you dive down there, exploring the wreck, finding hidden artifacts and learning about the Mars and its history bit by bit. And there are places that simply don't exist anymore. In 2017, an old banking building that was, about, uh, was scheduled to be knocked down was handed over to the amazing street artists from the Dixons. And they got a lot of their friends on there, and they turned the entire thing from floor to bottom into one amazing street art, uh, artwork. Not only the rooms where there were over 100 of them, but literally everything, the hallways, the toilets, everything. And eventually we were introduced to the Dixons and over a couple of Jägermeisters, we made the deal to scan the entire thing. So for the next two weeks, we were there every night because during the day, there were all still visitors there because the clock was ticking and we scanned the entire place, which was an amazing project. And when we showed it to the artists a couple of months after the building was knocked down and we had the first draft ready, they really came out and hugged us because it was such a special time for them. And to see that brought back was very intense. We also had about 70 interviews with some of the artists um, filmed in front of green screens with stereo cameras. So you can actually step in there and meet the artists and hear the stories of their artworks. So what are we up to now? While VR is an amazing tool, it also still has its constraints. And one of those constraints is the mode of exploration. So often you don't have enough space around you and enough tracking volume to really, really move through these large spaces that we often scan. And um, we had, a, as Bob Ross would call it, a happy little accident somewhere along the way where we imported one of our scans and it was all jumbled up, the little pieces of it. And our graphics programmer, Shah, said, hey, let's just turn this into a puzzle. And we looked at each other and we were like, wait, this is genius. And so now we are currently working on what's called Puzzling Places, which is a meditative, wholesome VR app that brings you into this relaxed environment and allows you to puzzle amazing places bit by bit. And the cool thing is it brings these places into arm's reach. You don't have to move around a lot. You can just stand there and take the pieces and put them together. And as everybody who has ever done a puzzle knows, puzzling a place is a very special thing, even if it's just a photograph, because you learn so much about all these little details. And puzzling in VR is even stronger. It leaves you with this very special spatial representation of the entire place that you will really come to cherish in the, in the course of putting that all together. So, what's next? Well, similar to VR having still its kinks and drawbacks, also 3D scanning, despite all the amazing things we can do, is still a very crude tool these days. It's very difficult when you go out there and you do a scan because you have to know a lot of things to get it right. And it's, it's, it feels a little bit like in the days of analog photography, where you, you know, have to put all the dials right, you then take the picture, you come home, you develop it, and then it just turns out, oh, it didn't work out. So the time between you going out, scanning, taking your pictures back home, running them through, and seeing the result is very long, which makes it a very hard thing to learn. But we're seeing already changes here. Apple just released its new iPads with LiDAR scanners that are capable of mapping surroundings. And also smartphones starting to have apps that allow you to do similar things. Similar to the advent of digital photography, the quality is just not there yet compared to the things that we are doing and the scan level that we have. But they will be eventually. And then a lot more people will be able to scan. Another thing that is still tricky is you just cannot scan everything these days. There are still things that are hard to scan, like foliage, reflective surfaces, or transparent surfaces. Those will require a lot of effort in the cleanup process afterwards. So what we do instead is we're looking at new technologies that can enhance scanning. 
in a lot of academia labs and R&D labs of big companies, neural rendering is one of the hot topics that's been worked on. That's using machine learning to change how we render digital content. And we've also run our own experiments that you can see here in combining digital capture or like classical capture technologies with these new neural rendering approaches. And the results have been amazing. So we're really excited to work more on this and see if we can solve all of some of these basic, basic problems that still are there for 3D scanning. So in summary, in the future, I think a lot more people will be able to scan a lot more places. And I think that can enable us to travel to amazing places all around the globe, just in time. Because not only are we in a global pandemic, but we're also facing unprecedented climate and ecological crisis. And we have to reduce our footprint on the planet if we want to continue living here as a species. So I hope that VR can do its part to allow us to explore wonderful places all around the world, to enable all of us to explore these places without destroying them and with leaving something for the generations to come. Thank you.